to introduce um, uh, the international winners. Now, NAP NAPCRAG has a reciprocal relationship with other national and international research groups, um, and this enables the top research to be disseminated globally. Um, and our first one is the, the, the award winner from uh, AAAPC. Now, this is the Australasian um, Association of Primary Care. And in Australasia, is not just Australia, it's Australia and New Zealand. So um, the award winner here is um, Ronnie um, Gerson. Uh, he's originally from Sweden, but he's now an associate professor uh, at the James Cook University in Cairns, and, uh, nor northern Queensland in Australia. So welcome, Ronnie. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we have a discussion around should we treat patients having a sore throat caused by group A streptococci at all? We also have another discussion. If we are to treat them, how do we identify the correct patients to treat? During this presentation, I'm not going to talk about the first question at all, but I'm well aware of that discussion. I'm going to talk about Assuming we want to treat them, how do we treat the right patients? Uh, I live most of my life in Sweden, engaged in uh, research around the sore throat, and eventually took a PhD in um, managing the sore throat, and was a bit successful in Sweden. Then I moved to Australia, Life was quite different in Australia, not at all as I really imagined from the beginning. I'm having a presentation here, it's a conference, you know. Uh, okay, you have, you have a sore throat, okay. So, yeah, tender anterior lymph nodes and, ouch, 38.4 uh, Celsius, it's 101 Fahrenheit. And, yeah, no cough, and hang on, I need to use my phone here as a torch, and yeah, I, I could take a photo of the throat, and I have, I have a Bluetooth app here, so I can transfer the picture to the laptop. So you should be able to see it up there. So, um, Mr. Sundval here, he has 10 anterior lymph nodes, no cough or inorrhea, clear fever, and the throat looks like this. Please raise your hands if you would like to give Mr. Sundval an antibiotic prescription. Okay, Mr. Sundwald, that's a fair number of prescriptions you need to digest. Anyone of you who definitely don't want to prescribe antibiotics, please raise your hands. There's a couple of hands, not many. So, the problem we are dealing with here is Mr. Sundwald can have a group A strep infection, he could have a viral infection. He could have a viral infection, but at the same time being a carrier of group A strep. And it would be good if we had some kind of test that could sort this out for us. So what kind of tests do we have available? Well, first of all, we have the famous test flipping a coin. The test was positive. Here is your prescription, Mr. Sundra. Actually, I usually don't flip the coin in front of the patient. I go to another room and flip the coin, and then I go back and tell the test, the diagnostic test was positive. Here's the prescription. Flipping a coin is, in one sense, a very good test, because the test properties, sensitivity and specificity, are well known and stable. Are there any other options? Yes. We can use different various clinical signs and symptoms to try and sort this out. Center criteria are probably mo the most famous ones, but there are heaps of other versions of clinical scoring. 
it's a quick test. It's not very expensive. Um, the test characteristic sensitivity and specificity is marginally better than flipping a coin. Some other scoring algorithms are actually worse than flipping a coin, and it would be better to avoid inspecting the patient at all and just flipping a coin instead. Other alternatives is these rapid antigen detection tests, which has been around for maybe two decades. The most modern versions of these are very quick, actually has a very good test characteristics. They're quite cheap and, and quite useful. And then we have the conventional so-called gold standard. The downside with that is that it takes quite a long time before you have the result. And when the result comes, all is over, and the actual impact on the clinical management is either minimal or none at all. And now we are starting to get these nucleic acid tests, which are, is a, a kind of similar test as PCR tests, that are actually being very quick and not very expensive. And they have fabulous sensitivity and specificity. And, and the current gold standard today would probably be the true PCR. Uh, the problem with that is that they are still quite expensive. They are not as quick. So to me, the most interesting candidates to discuss further is a rapid antigen detection test or the nucleic acid test. Uh, and I'm sure in, in five or ten years' time, I think it will all be these nucleic acid tests. But currently, the rapid antigen detection tests are quite competitive. Let's assume we want to evaluate this rapid antigen detection test and to identify its properties. What kind of properties are we interested in? Well, we have the sensitivity and specificity, which is perfect if you are a manufacturer of a diagnostic test. If you're creating guidelines, you would like to know the likelihood rates you, but most of us are managing patients. And if we are managing patients, we would like to know something called predictive values. And we have two versions of predictive values. We have the positive predictive value, which is the probability, probability of the gold standard being positive if the test is positive. And then we have the negative predictive value, which is the probability of the gold standard being negative if the test is negative. So we need to compare this rapid test with some kind of gold standard. What kind of gold standard would be appropriate in the situation when we want to clarify the situation with Mr. Sundval here? Uh, we have different options. Please raise your hand if you think uh, a conventional throat culture would be a, a, a proper gold standard to use to evaluate the test characteristics of this rapid antigen detection test. A few hands is being raised. If you think that PCR for group A strep would be the appropriate gold standard, please raise your hand. OK, a few more hands is raised. Uh, the if we use a throat culture or a PCR, they would give us the predictive value of the rapid test to predict if there is a group A strep in the throat. It doesn't really help us to sort out whether Mr. Sundar is actually ill from the strep or if he's just carrying it. Raise your hand if you think that a rise in antistreptococcal titer would be a good gold standard. Yeah, we have a few hands up. So in theory, that would be the ideal way of differentiating between a carrier and those actually ill from group A strep. However, there was a study previously done where they took all patients attending for a sore throat, gave everybody antibiotics, took a throat swab on everybody, and those having a positive throat swab also had based on bloods taken and a later blood to see if they had a rise in their antibody titers. And you would expect that it was a difference in the outcome between those having a rise in their antibody titers compared to those who didn't rise. There was no difference at all. So, the situation we face is we want to clarify who is actually ill from group A strep, not just having it in the throat. 
So this is a situation we want to clarify. The problem with this situation is we don't really have a good gold standard. So how do we evaluate this fancy, cheap, quick, rapid anti DNA detection test when we really don't have a gold standard? Uh, and that is what we did in Australia in a study. And before I give you the results of that study, I need to clarify this situation a bit first. So we are talking about patients being ill from group A strep or having a sore throat, but they are ill for something else than group A strep. And the latter group can actually carry group A streptococci. So this is how it sort of looks like. But we can also say that if you're actually ill from group A strep, group A strep must be present. So that leaves us with six blue boxes we need to sort out. If we know the sensitivity of the rapid test to identify the presence of group A strep, whether Mr. Sundwall is ill from that or not, that gives us the relation between the two blue rows. If we know the prevalence of carriers among healthy people, that gives us the relation between the two right columns. And if we have this information, we can actually sort out uh, all the relations in this table and create a mathematical formula for a kind of etiologic predictive value. And this is the mathematical formula for positive etiologic predictive value, predicting the probability that you're finding in your swab is actually related to the symptom and not simply representing carriers. And there is a corresponding formula for negative etiologic predictive value. These formulas are a bit cumbersome, but they can be used to construct normograms. These normograms are quite useful. So what we did was in Australia, we took samples in kids between 3 and 15, healthy kids, and kids with a sore throat. And we found uh, less than 1% carrier rates, and the proportion of positive tests among patients with a sore throat was 26%. So that means a positive etiologic predictive value for finding a group A strep in that situation was very high. The yellow area represents the area where we, in any reasonable situation, would be some time. So that means in this situation in Australia, you can use this rapid test to rule in that they are sick from a group A strep. But in other scenarios where you have more carriers, you could not use it to rule in. So the usefulness of a positive test depends on the carrier rates. The corresponding for the negative predictive value looks quite different. So in this situation, the negative predictive value is very high, irrespective of scenario or relation between carriers and positives among patients. So you can always use this rapid test to rule out that they are sick from the group A strep. If we correspond, if we create the same probability curves for using center criteria as a diagnostic test and, and have the cutoff of three to four center criteria, you can see that it is really not useful to rule out the possibility that this patient actually has a group A strep throat. So, uh, we found in the Australian study that uh, antibiotics was given quite often despite having very low center criteria. Uh, and if we look at how they behave when it comes to prescribing antibiotics, we could see that only 55% were correctly managed, uh, but we missed 42% of the true group A strep infections. One could argue that these true group A strep infections are probably just carriers, but since we know that the carrier rate in this situation was less than 1%, they are actually true group A strep infections. If we structure it a bit more and go for uh, center criteria, would that improve the situation? Well, not really. Uh, uh, more are correctly managed, but we miss most of the true group A strep infections, which may not be a big deal if you're in a situation where rheumatic fever is low, but in this setting, rheumatic fever is quite, uh, uh, quite common, and the principal investigator, Ulrich Orda, had rheumatic fever himself. So let me summarize what we have found so far. Uh, clinical judgment 
was not very good and missed most of the true group A strep infections. So the central criteria managed slightly more patients correctly, but most of the patients didn't have group A strep anyway, but the central criteria also missed most of the group A strep infections. The rapid antigen detection test in our setting was useful both to rule in because there was very low carry rates and very useful to rule out. So, the concluding advice, first for the more ambitious uh, GP would be, pick a suitable test. I would recommend the rapid antigen detection test, eventually the nuclear acid test. Look in your own charts for the test you have done recently back in time. What proportion of them are positive among your patients with a sore throat? Then you need to buddy up and uh, identify the carry rate in your setting, which is a bit ambitious, but if you buddy up with other clinics, it might not be too difficult. Use normograms to identify your situation to see if you can use the positive outcome to rule in. But if you are less ambitious, just pick a test and use it as a stopping rule, meaning use whatever magic wand you have to decide whether you want to prescribe antibiotics or not. And when you decide, I want to prescribe antibiotics, then use the rapid test as a stopping rule to stop antibiotic prescribing. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much indeed, Ronnie. And that particularly interesting in New Zealand where we have very high rates of rheumatic fever, so it's particularly pertinent to us. We've got time for a few questions. Hi, I'm Michelle Griever, I'm a family doctor. Um, do you think it's ever okay to not give uh, an antibiotic to somebody who's sick and has a positive quick strep? What is the rate of rheumatic fever? Um, how many will we um, prevent? Is there a place for just like otitis media not treating? Like, where is it at this point? What, what, what should I do? Should I consider not even treating? You know, and, um, how many days of illness is saved by treating with an antibiotic? Should we treat an ill patient with positive quick strep? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so, should you treat uh, should you treat a patient with a group A strep positive test? Um, that depends, uh, and there are different opinions about this. Um, so it, it depends on is rheumatic fever common in the situation where you reside? Well, my answer would definitely be yes. If it's extremely rare, well, then we have the discussion that treating with antibiotics is only synt mainly symptomatic relief and maybe uh, paracetamol works equally good. Uh, and this sort of, you have to take this discussion uh, and take into consideration the situation and scenario you have in your country. So if, there, if there's no more questions, um, I'd like to thank um, Professor Gunnison very much uh, for, for the presentation. Thank you.